Lewis influenced the playing styles of every major jazz musician on the East Coast. They admired his projection and authority, his perfect time, his profound understanding of the blues. He became the favorite accompanist of all the great blues divas, including Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith. When he came back home to Chicago a year later, banners were out to proclaim his return. Everywhere he went, after he left New Orleans, somebody was sending for him to come and play. King Oliver sent for him, Fletcher Henderson sent for him, and everybody sent for him. And whenever he came, a transformation took place, and it was always people imitating him. I went with so many different organizations. I went with Place Can Tape there at the Vendum at that time. And, and as you, you go along, you know, you're changing mm -hmm. the styles. And, and uh, there's playing for silent pictures, big old something else. You're playing for silent pictures. And after the curtain go up, you play Overture and, and uh, Hot Number. That's where I came in, you know. Whenever Louis would play, stand up and play that solo in the Vendum, the people would start screaming. You couldn't hear Louis what he was playing for a few bars because the people were screaming it, wanted him. And just you let that light hit him and he was beautiful standing up there. While thrilling the crowds at the Vendome, Louis romanced the beautiful Alpha Smith, the third Mrs. Armstrong, and recorded the Hot Fives and Hot Sevens. Few musicians could match him back then. One who came close was his recording partner, pianist Earl Hines, whose single note phrases and powerful octaves were dubbed trumpet-style piano. I had never thought that I'd run across anybody who had the style that I would like to play if I was going to play trumpet. So I used it on the piano. That's why they call it trump trumpet-style piano. So when I ran across Louis and we started working together, he'd steal something from me and say, thank you. I'd steal something from you and say, thank you. That's where we went wrong. <laughs> Louis's record swept the world, planting the seeds from which the swing era would soon emerge. In 1929, Louis was beckoned once again to New York. This time, he would become a major star. At Connie's Inn in Harlem, he sang and played Fats Waller's Ain't Misbehavin' so successfully that his performance was inserted into the Broadway production Hot Chocolates. His first big pop hit was Ain't Misbehavin' when he played in the pit band, the Connie's Hot Chocolates, and he got up and he did a solo. And uh, that's the first time the commercial war world really found out about Louis Armstrong. Now from the land where blues were born comes a man and a horn. Fifteen years later, he would be invited to recreate that triumph opposite Dorothy Dandridge in the movie Atlantic City. Man with a No one to talk with, all by myself. No one to walk with, I might be on the shelf. Aim this for heaven, save my love. Oh, baby, did this as easy No forsaken, the one I love. And through it plaining, you that I'm thinking of. Aim this for heaven. Saving my love. Like Jack Horner in a corner, don't go nowhere, and I don't care. All your kisses are worth waiting for. Believe me, I don't stay out late, leave gin alone. I'm home about it, just me and my gramophone. Ain't misbehaving, said I love you. In 
1930, Lewis went to Los Angeles and headlined at Sebastian's Cotton Club, where he won the admiration of numerous Hollywood stars. The trip ended in calamity, however, when he was arrested for smoking marijuana in his car with a white musician between sets. A shady manager from Chicago had his sentence reduced to a few weekends in jail, but Armstrong, who called pot an insulator against the pain of racism, continued to smoke it all his life. Every night on intermissions, I would, you know, go out and uh, roll up a couple of joints of good Mexican grass. So, uh, you know, Auburn Pops was out there, you know, and he would come out with what he would call his New Orleans Golden Leaf, which is very, very sad. It was terrible. Did nothing. You know, so funny thing happened when, you know, after a couple of weeks I noticed, you know, every time I was in a mission, I'd go outside, you know, and possibly be there, you know, sitting on the garden wall or on the chair, whatever we had available. And, uh, So finally one night I asked him, I said, Pops, I said, listen, I, you know, I noticed the last couple of weeks you don't, you don't come out with your New Orleans Golden Leaf anymore, you know. He said, sure, son. That's like bringing a hamburger to a banquet. <laughs> <laughs> you could really tell when Pops was high. Pops was really low. And especially when he come back off of intermission. When he come off of intermission, Pops be ready. Oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. He says, I'm ready, I'm ready, so help me, I'm ready. And when he said that, <laughs> the folks rest rolled and, and the band <laughs> laughed too. And, and he was ready. He Pops was really ready. Mm -hmm. Armstrong was now fronting a big band directed for him by Zilna Randolph. Back in Chicago, he discovered that the incident in Los Angeles had unexpected repercussions. Two managers, each affiliated with different gangsters, were warring over his contract. One night, this big bad-ass hood crashed my dressing room at the showboat in Chicago and told me I had to be in New York the next night. I told him I got the Chicago engagement and don't plan no traveling. Then he flashed a pistol at me and cocked it. I said, well, <laughs> maybe I am going to New York. But Armstrong and his band escaped Chicago that night. He would stay on the run for four years, performing in Europe and in much of the United States, but not in Chicago or New York. During a visit to New Jersey, he guest starred in a Betty Boop cartoon. I'll be glad when you get dressed in blue. Oh, in blue. For I brought you to my home. You would leave my wife alone. I'll be glad when you get dressed in you. Now, I'll be glad when you get dressed in you. I'll be tickled to death when you leave this old you dog. I took you for my friend. Where you put me in the back was the same. You ain't no good to rest with you. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. All right, yeah. Look at you, dog. I tell you, he was a brother, boy. While still on the run, he made his first professional visit to New Orleans in nine years. The prodigal son returned to the Waif's home, now known as the Municipal Boys' Home. He learned that a local baseball team had been named after him. Despite all the acclaim, a white announcer refused to introduce him on the radio. Lewis shrugged off the insult and introduced himself. When he learned that blacks would not be allowed to attend his performances, he promised to return and play exclusively for them. He fulfilled his promise with an appearance at the Golden Dragon a few years later. Europe was hungry for his presence. On arriving in England, he was crowned with a permanent new nickname. As a boy, friends had tagged him with various monikers to describe his large mouth, among them Satchel Mouth. An editor who had misheard it greeted him with a shortened version. Among fellow artists, Armstrong was already known as Pops, but from then on, millions of fans around the world would know him as Satchmo. When Satchmo arrived in Denmark, 10,000 people met his railway carriage. 
The Danes also had the prescience to film him in performance. Now, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Armstrong. The next number we're going to swing for you is one of the good old favorites. That's uh, Dinah, Dinah. Look out there, boy. Are you ready? Look out. State of Carolina, if there is any, you know, show to me, Dinah, the dick not pleasant. 